We've now seen that Berklin has a rather naturalistic face, something where he's close to almost a realistic take on nature, for example. We've seen that he's moved on to a romantic understanding of landscape as a backdrop, as something that enhances the atmosphere of his work. And we've then moved on to the symbolist Berklin. And here we are again, Berklin painting symbolist specters. And as I said, Berklin became one of the, the key figures real, uh, really of the symbolist movement throughout Europe. This is one of the last, if not the last, painting that Arnold Böcklin executed. It's called The Plague. And it shows the figure of death astride on an ugly dragon, sweeping through a town, the narrow streets of a city. And the dragon is shown with these bat-like dark wings and this ugly neck that ends in this beak-like head and it breathes miasma, something like deadly steam. So when you realize that this work was painted at a time where it was not yet established what actually killed people when they were hit by the plague or when they were hit by cholera or typhus, you, you maybe get a sense of the, um, the, the horror that must have per, um, permeated the streets because people did not know what killed them. Today, at least, in, in most instances, we know the, the sort of transmission, the ways of transmission, and we know what, what we are up against. But if you imagine that um, India at the time when Berkeley painted this was ravaged by the plague, and people did not yet fully understand what actually caused the illness, and they were dropping dead left and right, that must have been an entirely other level of, of horrific um, helplessness to experience. And I think it's interesting how this work during the corona crisis became so, so prominently displayed um, in places like newspapers and magazines, because you can see that, that art can be painted at one point in time and mean something, and then decades later, maybe centuries later, in a different um, sociological context, gain an entirely new meaning and maybe even more pertinence. Speaking of symbolist specters and giving form and shape and actually personifying something that you can see and understand, that's something that also happens here in this work by Albert Welty, who was the young disciple or the young apprentice, I should say, of Berklin's. He painted with Berklin in his um, Zurich studio and then desperately tried to detach himself from the master. He even moved to Munich to find his own footing. And then um, still in that phase, you see there are strong similarities. He had not yet gained his own style, but he's strongly influenced still by his master. And um, what he's painting here are riders in the mist. Basically, he observes a mountaintop and sees the swirling fog around it. And then it's this, this sort of idea that what you see as a natural phenomenon has to have a, a different cause, something that you can attribute to this natural phenomenon you actually see. So in this case, they are riders who dance or, or chase around the mountaintop. And this is how he, how he paints it. He basically inscribes these riders into the fog. They are barely discernible, but then again, you see their figures and you realize this is what the fog looks like when it's swirling. So the symbolist specters we see here are the plague. And the plague, of course, is a stand-in for all sorts of dangerous illnesses that Berklin himself was intimately acquainted with because his life and the life of his family had frequently been threatened by illnesses like the cholera and um, typhus. And in this, this instance, you, you again see this, um, the, this idea that you give shape to something that's, that's maybe a natural phenomenon. So um, you see the riders chasing around a mountaintop and personifying, giving shape to the swirling fog. Berklin's fame as a symbolist painter in the late 19th century is almost entirely based on his creation of this work, The Island of the Dead. 
Berkeley created several versions of this subject, but this is the first and most important one. We are not entirely sure what happens here, and that's part of the mystique surrounding this painting. We see an island, we see the Black Sea surrounding it and removing it from our realm of experience. And we see these vertical trees rearing up against the black sky, so these cypress-like Mediterranean trees. And there is a figure cloaked in white and a shrouded coffin, and both move on a bark towards this island, which makes us guess that probably this is the burial ground. But we don't really know the context. It's just that all these signs that we are given evoke something for us, and, and we get a feeling for the, for the atmosphere, the solemnity of the scene, which is why we use this work to compare it with Max Ernst's version of the great forest. And you get a feeling that Max Ernst, who worked decades later, is one of the most important surrealist painters, that he really took Berkeley's Island of the Dead and wanted to reinterpret the theme. But of course, it's also his own creation and something entirely different. But you also get the horizontal orientation, the vertical orientation of these trees of the great forest. You get the entirely black backdrop of the sky and to add to the mystique of the atmosphere again, light in a strange ring-shaped form of a celestial body, which tells us it can't be um, part of our realistic experience of the world, but of something surreal, because we just don't know of a, of a star that looks like that. Both painters here work with elements in the, in the painting that, that create an emotional resonance in the beho beholder. And that is something that, that to, to give shape to our feelings and to create something where our feelings can attach themselves to and relive something that the painter presents us with, that's basically the essence of symbolism. Of all the facets of Berkeley that we have introduced so far, this one is a, is a thematic one. The theme of um, horse and rider is something that dates back to antiquity. It's something that is, is um, present throughout art history. The strong union of beast and man. If you think back to equestrian statues, for example, that it's a unity and um, they, they both enhance each other's force. So on the left-hand side, in this case, you see Berkeley's um, fight on the bridge. You see a barbarian force charging into the picture from the left-hand side to the middle. And then they overwhelm civilized forces that are also properly dressed in armor to the right. And the barbarians, of course, themselves, they are naked and they are wild and unleashed. The bridge itself is barely holding um, and Below the bridge, in a the, in the muddy stream, you see people struggling for their lives and trying to rescue themselves to the other border. Of course, a painting like this can't happen with blue sky in the background, so the backdrop, the, the sky is appropri appropriately dark and tempestuous. Edgar Degas was active in the um, Impressionist circle in Paris. And here he paints a fallen jockey. And in fact, this work is the outcome of a 30-year-long struggle of a process that took him three decades to paint this subject of a man where the unity between horse and man is, is severed, is, is sundered. So this gains almost a symbolical meaning of modern man and modern times because um, the prefiguration of this theme of someone who fell off the horse is maybe the road to Damascus, the biblical story of Saul who fell from his horse when he saw the vision of God. And he was converted, he, had a, he was granted a new beginning, a new chance to redeem himself. 
But in this case, you feel that this won't be the case with this fallen jockey. So there is no way we can regain the unity of horse and rider.